Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to this Wednesday edition of Open Mic. Thank you for being here. My name is Chris Carr, and I am joined, of course, by Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Rob, how you doing? I am doing uh, just absolutely swimmingly today. Yeah. Yeah, We're having fun already. We are are having fun already. It's always uh, good to be working with you. Mm -hmm. Mm. Likewise, we've got Taylor running things today. Yay, Taylor! So we are very excited to just get into this open discussion with all of you. But before we get to your super chats and everything, Rob, you weren't on the show this morning. I know. It was Girls Day. It was Girls Day. How come I don't get to be on Girls Day? I know. I really would love a show, honestly, where it got to be you, me, Aaron, and Amy. Oh, I, think it'd be I don't know. If, I don't know if the viewers or John would survive That's that one. That's true. It would be a lot. The viewers might. Yeah, we'd have fun. John would fire us all. Probably get demonetized within the first five minutes. At least, absolutely. And then I would be canceled, <laughs> even though I didn't say anything wrong. No, you would have. It would have been me or Aaron. Yeah, yeah. And then Amy just being like. <laughs> <laughs> but we did a couple minute mobile questions today. We've started adding more of those into the show, you guys. There's a hotline number you can call to leave us a voicemail with your questions, and we get to hear the lovely dulcet tones of your voice. But our viewer called in, and they were asking if you could redo the DCEU centered around Matt Reeves' Batman. And I wanted to know what you thought about that. That's a good question. I mean, you you could do that. But again, you know, we're always talking about tone, Yes. And I think the the thing about Matt Reeves' Batman was there was a very, it, the tone was different than what Christopher Nolan did in terms of there's, the, but there is definitely a realistic tone. I think it's interesting because I think Matt Reeves' Batman is somewhere between Tim Burton's Batman and Nolan's Batman. Oh, yeah. Nolan's Batman took place in literally almost the real world. Whereas there is a kind of sort of a heightened grunge thing going on with with Battinson's Batman. Yeah, he listens to My Chemical Romance. He's he's going through a time. Yeah, you know, he is going through a time. And I just think that there's, we haven't seen much of the outside world. And the idea is, could you then bring in Green Lantern? Could you bring in Wonder Woman? Could you bring in Superman to Matt Reeves' Batman world? My first inclination would be to say no. Mm -hmm. Because if you did that, if you brought a superhero that was either wearing a a ring of power or was an Amazonian and a a god from the likes of the loins of Zeus, however they got there, you know, clay, whatever. And then Superman, the tone that Matt Reeves created, I think would be shattered. Mm -hmm. I think that you, because once you have a Kryptonian, then any problems that Batman has in Gotham could be alleviated because there's going to be no threat that can't be vanquished. I mean, Superman uses his X-ray vision, find wherever anybody is, and then throw them in the sun. Yeah. So I think Batman is sort of neutered. But the interesting thing is when you have the Ben Affleck Batman, because he's this madly rich industrialist, he's brilliant. He basically has, he's a captain of industry around the world, and he's he's a ninja fighter He's got all these things. Yeah. He's already kind of heightened, whereas Robert Pattinson's Batman, he's grungy, yes. gutter rat Batman or gutter rat bat. I mm-hmm. mean, so it's, a, but I'm not saying you couldn't do it, but I don't think the kind of Superman that we want to see would work in that universe. Yeah. You could make a Superman work, but would it be the Superman people want to see? See, that's a great point, because you could get into some kind of Red Sun stories yeah. or some of those things. It's just not really congruent with, you know, the Shazam and the Aquaman, the Wonder One we have. Right. I mean, once you go that way, I think Battinson's Batman becomes sort of irrelevant because, he, I mean, he's living in an old train station or whatever, you know, yeah. fixing his car himself. He doesn't. So he's 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 truly a one man, dark knight, lone wolf character no i'm not saying it can't be done mm-hmm. but i just think that what matt reeves is doing and probably will do with his trilogy of batman movies if that's what he's going to make i don't know if that's the way we would want to see i think it'd be a great interesting dceu to build in that arena oh, for sure but i don't think that's what people want because then you get a superman that's more dark and gritty or not the hey all shucks christopher reeves superman i mean i loved i love madison i love cavill superman but nobody liked that either mm-hmm. like that was too much like he's gonna kill zod if superman existed in, in battinson's universe he would kill oh i agree he would that. kill if there's some bad dude like zod is like 
out of here. You're gone. Well, it'd be fun to play with the juxtaposition of that, right? Of having somebody who is overpowered and very altruistic right. going up against Batman. That's true, too. So that could be fun. The one thing I would love in here, because you brought up like a, a people with like power rings, right? If we had like a Kyle Rayner in here and we went with the death of his girlfriend, if we did that whole like Gail Simone coined women in refrigerators, right? If we right. had the girlfriend shoved in a refrigerator, which I know is horrible, you guys, but that's what happens in the comics. That makes sense in this Batman world. Yeah. But then I wonder if the, the overpowered individuals in Gotham are problematic and if you need to keep things Well, then the, que up. the question would be that if, <laughs> and if the question has always arise that if you have a Superman in the world, why isn't he just going out and vanquishing? Why doesn't he just take out Everyone. organized crime everywhere yeah. around the planet It'd probably take him a week you know all the arms trading and all that but he can't so the 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 stop the backstop to that is well you can't interfere with the affairs of humanity even though of course you interfere every day yeah, yeah. And, and so even when you rescue a cat you know you're still interfering mm -hmm. you don't let that poor kid climb that tree and get the cat out himself and find out well don't let your cat outside or whatever that's true would you want the Matt Reeves Batman then to exist as its own entity within the DCEU? Yeah, well, I don't want to. Well, I don't think that that I want to see that Batman trilogy like Nolan's unto itself. OK. Her hermetically sealed. I mean, I think if they're going to reboot the I think it'd be really, really interesting to reboot the entire. I mean, look, I, I'd like to see Momoa's Aquaman get three movies. Mm -hmm. I would like to see as much as I hated the second Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman 84. I think she deserves a third film i would like to see the flash if it exists yeah to to uh, i mean i like the fact that there are trilogies because mm -hmm. you can take these characters through a bit of an arc yeah absolutely but i would love to see it rebooted like go back i'm not saying do george miller's justice league moral that never got made but do something new but but again it needs to be planned from the beginning you know and not by like it, it would be interesting to have a consortium of directors who are going to come in and t handle each character. And then they decide who's, if you're going to do a, the team movie first and you're going to then go out to individual films, plan it. Yeah. Plan the whole thing, plan a big arc. They say they want to do 10 years, then go plan 10 years and give us that. But it, it, that would take a lot. And I don't know if they can. I mean, mm -hmm. on one hand, they're reluctant to make two dunes at once. That's so how are they going to go do well we have a 10-year plan yeah well, all right we're hoping then too with the the new kind of world order over at warner brothers right that now that we have you know we're getting a designated person for the dc properties we're going to give them their due time and everything hopefully there is a, a trajectory that makes sense and that they follow through on the problem is even if they hire somebody who's going to take over dc and they're going to find that person and they say yeah we're going to have a 10-year plan it's still going to be a performance-based system. Absolutely. Every movie has to perform. Otherwise, your whole plans will poof, go up in a, go to hell in a handbasket because that's not, studios don't work that way. Mm -hmm. They will never commit. I mean, it, it, it was a miracle that the Lord of the Rings movies were committed to by New Line to make all three. And the fact that they're like, yeah, we're going to do 10 years. No, you're not. No, you're not because they're too expensive and you can't commit. And one of those movies fails. I mean, Marvel was lucky in that you had Iron Man 1 and 2. I mean, The Incredible Hulk was over at Universal, but they did a pretty good job doing that, building that foundation. They still, it took them four years to get to the Avengers and it worked. Mm -hmm. But even Iron Man 2, when they introduced Black Widow, I like that movie. I think that movie's aged well, but it wasn't as good as Iron Man 1. No. But it was fun. No. Well, and that's what's so fun about Chef is that's kind of like that inverse critique. Well, people have read into that, right? Of, I'm just trying to do what I do. Just let me do it. Just make, let me make my movies. Oh, oh man. Well, that is all very, very astute, Robert. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Well, thank you, Chris. You're so welcome. I appreciate that. Yeah, anytime. Well, we are going to get into your Super Chat questions, but first we are going to hear from the sponsor of this episode of uh, Open Mic. I forgot what show this was for a second. <laughs> I was like, which one are we doing? It's kind of appropriate. Yeah. Which after show are we on? Um, and these folks, gosh, you guys, if you want to get hot and heavy, but it's a little, little bit of a jungle down there. Go check out Manscaped. We want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's video, Manscaped. Now, guys, you know I love Manscaped. You've heard me go on and on about the Lawnmower 4.0 and mm, 
Mmm, that body wash, I love it so much. And so we gotta ask, guys, have you started your spring cleaning yet? The carpets need cleaning, the drapes need dusting, and your lawn needs mowing, gentlemen. And you guys know Manscaped isn't more than just one product. They have a whole lineup of products to help you guys feeling, smelling, and looking your best. And so Manscaped is proud to present to you the Performance Package 4.0, which is the only tool that you need to keep your boys looking, smelling, and feeling good this spring. Now, to start off with, you get the Lawnmower 4.0. Guys, we have talked about this. What is wrong with us? Why have we for so long been using these terrible tools that were never meant for cutting our hair down there? The razor clipper things on our electric razors. That's barbaric, guys. You need the Lawnmower 4.0. And then there's the Weed Whacker. You guys have heard our own Ray Aura talk about this thing. He loves using it to get that hair in your nose and the ear hair. And then they offer lots of other stuff like the Crop Preserver. It's an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. The Crop Reviver, it's a spray-on toner for your balls. And of course, they've got the perfect grooming tool for your face with the Plow 2.0, the perfect razor for the finest shave on that face. So guys, get 20% off plus free shipping with the code CAMPIA, that's C-A-M-P-E-A at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the promo code CAMPIA. Campia at manscaped.com. It's time to throw your old hygiene habits and upgrade your life. And thank you once again to Manscaped. Manscaped, who I'm sure loves that I'm the person doing this ad. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. <laughs> Actually, I think they probably are. Yeah. Just, you know, do your due diligence, guys. Be polite. Get Manscaped. Wonderful. Well, Rob, will you want to get into the super chat? Yes, let's do that. <laughs> let's super chat. I'm getting so close to demonetization. Danny Sanchez sends in a super chat and says, new Joy Coy's Joel Co <laughs> The new Joe Coy special is a banger, which I'm glad because it, anything has to be better than Easter Sunday. Yeah. Were you in person? None of us got to see it. And I know John loves him as a comedian, yeah. but none of us got to see his latest stuff. He's he, really funny. He was so funny at CinemaCon. Oh, man. I, I wanted Easter Sunday to be great because of how funny and charismatic he was just owning that room. Yeah, he was great. And oh. Unfortunately, Easter Sunday. Not so much. But glad this is good. Mm. All right. What else? Uh, Danny Sanchez goes on to say, I love the show. I've been watching since the Venom review. That's a long time, oh. Danny. Wow. Well, thanks, Danny. Thanks for supporting. Absolutely. It's so sweet. Who's next? Uh, Chase O says, hi, John and Rob. Did you see David Harbour is going to be Santa Claus in Violent Night? The action thriller follows Santa Claus as he must save a kidnapped family from mercenaries on Christmas Eve. So that really will answer the question whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Absolutely. Because if Santa is saving a family on Christmas Eve, oh, comes out December 2nd in theaters. Be uh, Violent Night, I'm all in on that. Didn't you send that, Taylor? You oh, sent yeah. Yeah. I sent a text in the group chat this morning that said, ho, so ho, ho, holy shit, I can't wait for this. <laughs> now I have a machine gun. Now, ho, ho, ho. This is one, too. And thank you for that $50 super chat, dude. That is so, so generous of you. We really appreciate it. We saw a little bit of this one at CinemaCon, too. It does feel like an SNL sketch. Yeah. And not a movie. That said, will I go see this? Will I stop at MacGuffin's first and have some shots and then go see this? Absolutely. Okay, I have to say mm -hmm. that I have a dream film project that I want to see made that is all about Santa Claus. Awesome. And it is about, it's called Santa Steps Out, and it's based on a novel by Robert Devereaux. Okay. And in it, Santa has an affair with the Tooth Fairy that has ramifications that sh shook the world. And it is borderline X-rated. The book is borderline X-rated. If they did it as an animated film or live action, Hollywood, Robert Devereaux's Santa Steps Out. Is this kind of like Lost Girls, but with with holiday figures Ooh, kind of okay kind of but it's it is it is a hoot Ooh. i mean i don't know if anyone would make it yeah like a, a european company would make it for sure i was gonna say an american audience wouldn't be like oh santa fox that's uh, totally oh fine. yeah it's it's <laughs> it's not and he's like he stepped out on mrs claus why yes he did you know but if you find the book kind of hard well i guess it's not that they've reprinted it santa steps out if you like Robert Devereaux is a great dark fantasy novelist. He wrote a great book called Dead Weight. Ooh. But Santa Steps Out, take it from your, from your Uncle Bobby here. If you want to read a fun book and you like Christmas. And you really want Santa to get some strange, you know, read Ooh. that book. Does he? <laughs> Santa Steps Out, Robert Devereaux. Wonderful. Go order it right now and tell him I sent you. Nice. Well, and then we'll see how this violent night pans out. Love me some David Harper. All right. What else do we have? Chase O says, uh, 
Oh, that's the, oh, that's Sam the other Fisher. one. Sam Fisher. Sam, wait, did I already get that? Okay. No, it's a new one. Sam. Sam Fisher says, regarding not marketing the Emmy, the only way I knew about it is that my cousin, who's a talent agent, posted he was going to the Emmys for his 32nd anniversary. Sam, I got to go with you there. Normally, I know the Emmys are on. There was, I had no idea yeah. the Emmys were on. We were talking about this earlier this morning. I mean, usually, I mean, living in Los Angeles too, you see the billboards everywhere. You cannot escape knowing the time and everything about the Emmys. And this year, it really felt like radio silence. Uh, uh, maybe it's because we're out here in, uh, you know, the Inland Empire. Uh, out in Riverside. <laughs> maybe I'm missing out on, but yeah, it was weird. I didn't know. But even, I mean, driving around my neck of the woods, right? Studio City, North Hollywood, there's there's nothing posted. And that's where it should be. Studios there. Yeah, I I walk by CBS Studios like twice a week and I did not know the Emmys were. By the way, no, is it the NoHo 16? Save the NoHo 16, the theater. (laughs) Yes. Why are they, they're going to turn it into a mixed use? uh, Oh man. I know. I love that theater. It's because the neighborhood's getting way too trendy. It's a bummer. (sighs) And why wouldn't you want a great theater like that there? I don't know. Uh, That's the place you want it. Exactly. Otherwise, why move there? Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, what? (laughs) <laughs> uh, Mike A says most definitely TVA agents in the werewolf trailer they were pruning something so excited for man thing Nexus realities I think this will be special well Mike A I definitely agree with you I went back and looked TVA agents are in that trailer yeah. they're pruning something maybe they're using Manscaped <laughs> isn't there one that's called like the, the, the all of them are all very lawnmowery yeah they are right but yeah that trailer looks so good though and wow. i am so glad they pointed out it's the tva because well, yeah i went back too i hope it's good it's a whole other layer in there i'm very excited what else do we have uh danny sanchez says liking she hulk but the last episode was unfulfilling you shared that sentiment too i i i, I just thought it was it was the tone of it again i'm all about tone and i thought the tone was because it, it, the show, I love situational humor and Jennifer Walters being who she was and then turning into She-Hulk. There's enough situational humor there and about the world that she exi- exists in with superheroes and having to defend them or whatever. There's comedy enough. And then when they go further and you've got goofy demons that you're throwing through a portal with Wong, it's like, no, I mean, the Madison stuff was enough. Yeah. Keep, keep it on that level because you know what? Those goofy demon things did not have to be in She-Hulk. That was a Wong problem. That wasn't a She-Hulk problem. She just happened to be there. Mm-hmm. I mean, Wong could probably snap his fingers and all those creatures would be gone, but they had to give her like an action scene. They didn't need to do that. Yeah, it made her It made her a jobber. It made her a jobber. And that's kind of a bummer. So hopefully Don't tonight, like have you seen the new clip too of the courtroom scene that we're seeing tonight? No. Oh, this, this looks like the kind of show that we've been waiting for. This okay. looks like we're getting into that Ally McBeal courtroom drama, kind of back to what we had with the shapeshifter. So I'm hoping that this revs things So back this up. is episode five. It's the middle yeah. of the show. Hope it's good. Yeah, because only four more after this. Yeah. Come on, She-Hulk. I believe in you. <laughs> Me too. I believe in you. Taylor and I have matching shirts. Come on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, Sadia Swift says, you're at the D23 when you hear someone loudly eating something and they say, what's wrong? He can't get in. He can go in with me. You turn and it's Adam Aaron eating ketchup and eggs. What you doing? <laughs> that's obviously a Ooh, John. That's scenario. a John question. I don't want to speak for John, but um, uh, I think he might go in. Maybe. Or he's going to smack that tray out of his hand. He might, but I don't think he'd do that because John, mm-hmm. John, even, even when he's in mixed company, he's... He he's comports very, himself he's very, very polite. He's very Emily Post. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I let the Boston trash out of me. Yeah. And I'm like, ah. Although I, I, I'm i a ketchup and eggs person. I'm one of those monsters. Yeah. I mean, I, I put like Tabasco on it. I usually like to do Cholula. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not, not, uh, not ketchup. No. But he'd probably, he'd probably go in. CJ Rebirth says, as someone who took a film class, bro. A film class? Take As someone who took a film class, Steven Spielberg's West Side Story has me rewatching it and finding new camera work, color tones. Also love the Tonight song. That was a great... Oh. Uh, look, I, I really enjoyed Spielberg's West Side Story. The only thing I didn't love in it was where uh, Tony and Maria meet. Mm-hmm. behind. They some, why are they just behind the bleachers? I, I liked the heightened reality of the original where, where the dance becomes of this mythical, yes. mystical moment. Not like, and we're just standing here behind the bleachers. Well, and it's so much like it's Romeo and Juliet origins, right? Of that moment of just like connecting with each other and everyone else fading away, yeah. which is beautiful. The bleachers was very high school. But it was not exciting. I mean, it was visually sort of uninteresting. I agree with that. And they were kind of planted in one place. Mm-hmm. 
As opposed to having the lights swirling around, yeah, nothing mattered to you. Yeah, that magic moment. I do love, though, and you can speak, obviously, way more to this, Rob, of how once you start learning about film and analyzing film and taking these classes, how it does just open things up when you start watching stuff. Because I, I was a communications major, so it was mostly like film theory and history, and then I was done. Right. But obviously, as somebody who's in production and has studied all of this. Well, it's also there is a language of cinema as well mm. that goes beyond, I mean, a visual language in terms of how you tell a story using different shots, different lenses. And that's something that is truly cinema. And a lot of people don't pay any attention to it. Yeah. And a lot of people that are making movies these days don't know, don't use the language of cinema as well as they probably should. Ooh. So. Well said. Nice. Uh, Santez Henderson says, my only criticism of Hot D is the time jumps. <laughs> it's minor, but there seems to be a lot of drama happening in between the months and years between episodes. Game of Thrones rarely did this, and if it did, it wouldn't be a substantial amount. Well, I mean, I think that's part of the the the, the language of the show mm -hmm. is those time jumps. It, it, it is doing that on purpose to keep that pacing going. And I think once you set that up as a device, mm -hmm. it can work. Yeah, I agree with that. Because we also, I mean, we've had, Allison has had two babies. I, I don't want to go through the timeline of her actually having those two babies, right? I want that sped up because that's not interesting. I need the heirs to be there, not just heirs who are going to be existing in the universe. Well, and also there's not enough, like in Game of Thrones, they were jumping around to all these different places. You had all these different city states. You had all these different locations or mm -hmm. Winterfell and King's Landing and Castle Black and... Uh, what is Dav not Davos? Yeah, Davos. Da not Davos. Um, what Dorne and yeah. and uh, uh, the Iron Bank and and all the different cities that Daenerys went to and the uh, it's just you had all that so there would be time passing but there was all this other stuff going on. Whereas you're only in King's Landing and like you said, what are you going to do? Watch a nine month show where nine months have to go by before a second baby is born. Exactly. And in that period of time. Um, nothing happens that's progressing the main story. All they're giving us, you know, Hitchcock said, drama is life with all the dull bits cut out. Ooh. And they, that's what they're kind of doing in this. Is that's what it seems like. You know, the day-to-day -day operations of the city don't matter. We yeah. We're only focusing on the big major events. Exactly. Everyone's political machinations. And I think the time jumps do help with the tension between this family as well. Yeah. Th so that we know, oh my gosh, Rhaenyra and her father and her best friend have not been talking to each other on a regular basis for at least a year. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. All right. It's true. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, also, Santis, thank you for that $20 super chat. That's so generous. Yes, that is good. Sadia Swift says, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. That's, of course, Oracle. Wait, Rob, can you, yeah. can you do that in a different voice? Uh, well, that's kind of my gold finger, but no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Taylor. But that's not how he did it. Actually, that was Gert Frobe who was being dubbed in Goldfinger. Oh. The I third James Bond movie. Yeah. Came out in 1964. Interesting. Little After Dr. No and from Rush With Love. Yeah. On Thanksgiving, the our tradition is to watch a whole bunch of... James Bond movies. Oh, that's there you what go. Logan's family always did. Oh, that's I love that. Yeah, it's pretty cute. It's good. Yeah. What else we got? Kenzie Brumley says, Hi. I like the first Captain Marvel. I heard positive reactions to the Marvel's teaser, D23. Can DaCosta turn around with the reception of Captain Marvel like they did with Thor? Also, I'm loving uh the I'm on and Brie friendship. Oh my gosh, same. Uh, Taylor and I, when we were at lunch, these photos of them at D23 when they're meeting Harrison Ford are just oh, yeah. so, so cute. These ones are precious too. They just adore each other. Yeah, but and why I, wouldn't they? Yeah, they're both two incredibly talented actresses who love this fandom and love their characters and they get to play in like the best sandbox in the world right now. Yeah, and, and they're, I mean, they're teamed up together to fight who knows what they're fighting? Yeah. We didn't see the trailer. And I, I love that first Captain Marvel. I think it's... Uh, you know what? I didn't love it, but I liked it. Yeah. I actually saw it three times in the theater. Ooh. I don't know why. I kept... You You're know, just like, hoping... Well, I'll go back for... in. I'm going to give it another chance. <laughs> I, I just... I enjoy... You know what I liked about it? I liked the fact that it was a cosmic film. Yes. It, it took place in space. You had scrolls. You finally got back to Earth. Mm -hmm. And I really like Ben Mendelsohn and Talos. And I, 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 I mean, I... I, I thought it was good. I mean, I didn't dislike it. It, it. The funny thing is, is did it did it hit the highs of Civil War or mm. Winter Soldier? Yeah. No, but That's I fair. enjoyed it. I thought it was a fulfilling movie. You know what? I, you know, what I would equate it to something like The Rocketeer. Like I, I love, love The, the Rocketeer, Rocketeer, but The Rocketeer is not like it's not like a Christopher Nolan Batman movie. Yeah, but I really liked it. Yeah. I, I liked I liked Captain Marvel like I liked The Rocketeer. 
Is there a Rocketeer hot toy? Uh, there are multiple third-party rock. Actually, there's okay. a, I, I have a licensed Rocketeer Medicom figure and then i have a new one coming from black box toys mm. and it comes with the stand is is the fire coming out of his thing okay because i would i would get one of those that that would be dope it's very well. cool i think i just liked captain marvel so much because it did such a good job subverting my expectations about the scrolls because i went in right that, yes and that's what i which maybe if i rewatch again i might be like i can find some holes in this and but... by the way they are only one faction that's of the scrolls. exactly well that's what whoa that's what, whoa, whoa demonetized <laughs> No money for you. <laughs> Sam Fisher says, I'm going to try not to give you a heart attack here, John, but I have never seen Clerks or Clerks 2. Maybe I'll see it this weekend. Um, I mean, that's okay. You don't have Sam to see Sam Fisher, things. he saw that super chat and stormed out. No, yeah, no. you pissed him off. Yeah, that's okay. No worries. There's a lot of movies you need to see. I mean, I, you know, it's funny that there are geek touchstones that I, because I, I grew up with these things, so you, you saw them as they were new. But, you know, if you're born, let's say you were born, and we have a lot of, if you're born in 1990, 1990 to me that's late in the game you're 32 now yeah now in that time you weren't, you weren't even 10 years old in 2000 so think about everything you didn't see so you can't be expected to catch up with all the new stuff and then go back and watch everything you've missed i mean alien came out in 1979 then why are you so mad at me for not seeing aliens yet because my God, how could you? How could you not see that movie? I'm, I am, but a wee that, babe. That is, that is a classic. I mean, I'm so new that, to that, this that's universe. That's not like down the. That's not like down. Like Clerks and Clerks Two are down the. In terms mm -hmm. of the geek sphere, the things you have to know, like the canon yeah. of geek, like if there's the Western canon of literature, the canon of geek, canon the of geek, geek canon. Aliens is is need, in the top. I need 20. a list. I need the the. RMB definitive list of what you should be knowing. I and could watching. do that. Okay, I, I would appreciate say that. Alien, Aliens, Alien, and Aliens are in the top twenty, and Aliens see. in the top ten. Alien, I saw, I think, probably in like twenty nineteen at Cinespia for the first time. Just yes, looking like a dork in the cemetery because I'm the only person who didn't know how the movie went, so I was screaming. But that's good. Yeah, it's always good. Yeah. Chris, Aliens is so good. I will watch it with you. It's oh yeah. So okay. You're Wait, is it treat. so good in the way that you're like, oh, we should go see Barbarian? Or... No, it's so good as in like, come Maybe over, I'll make come salmon, over. salmon and uh, cauliflower and we'll, we'll watch Alien. Okay. Come to the Rob Observatory. <gasps> Ooh, and, and Dolby with, Cinema Yeah, with the, with the Atmos system. <gasps> all right, all right. That yeah. would be amazing. I love it. All right. Uh, Fangblaze 71 says, what do you think of the most forgettable MCU projects? For me, I always forget about Black Widow and Thor 4, even though they are quite new forgettable um you know I, I i hate to say it but i oh oh, oh. That, this fair. is it oh the most forgettable mcu thing ever yeah. I, I don't forget about thor 4 because we talk about it so much and, yeah. and black widow uh i i can't wait to put my task i'm just really happy that i was able to get a hot toys taskmaster for 120 bucks because taskmaster is part of the thunderbolts and so the price of that bad boy just went way up and they're not going to make any more. I mean, maybe they'll make a Thunderbolts Would version. Would you part ways with that, though? Would you profit on it? Or is that for no. you forever? Okay. No. no, if I have to sell my toys to live, I'm I'm failing in life. I appreciate that yeah. about you. Yeah. Yeah. You get them because you love them. Yeah. And I no, I will not. Unless they, if they were. See, I don't. Here's the thing. I'm not one of these guys. I like to collect the best iteration of things. Mm. Like, and I'll, I'll let stuff go if they make a better version of it. Like, I sold my original Avengers Captain uh, America. But I bought the Avengers Endgame Captain America oh. in the same uniform because the face sculpt is much better. Just a nice little swappy swap there. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly I mean, right. After time passes, Thor 4 will probably be my most forgettable because yeah. that movie just, it, it ended up bumming me out because I had such high expectations and the Gore the God Butcher character really, really just like kicks so much ass, literally and metaphorically, and has the best lines and... I just kind of waste on something a bit goofy. I that was that is my least favorite. I I really dislike that film. Yeah, and I am surprised that that's the case. Yeah, yeah, and a little bummed out about Doctor Strange too. I'm not gonna lie. Mm. Yeah. What else? The sock. What's your favorite silly song? Mine's Dancing Queen, but it's about frogs. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> um. Wow. <laughs> oh, Veggie Tales. What a throwback. I loved his Where's My Hairbrush song. You can tell I'm getting more comfortable running the show. Yeah. When I have Veggie Tales <laughs> ready to go. Um, What's your favorite silly song? My Ron? favorite silly song. Um, I don't know. Maybe Steve Martin singing King Tut. Oh yeah, I love that song. It I, is. I have that it's record. pretty good. It's wonderful. It's a great. It's a great uh, wild and is it wild and crazy guy? Is that the? No. Which one is it on? 
I'll take a picture of it. I'll remember it. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's a, a good one. Song. But you know what? I have to say, if I talk about silly songs, I think back to Dr. Demento. I used to listen to a lot of oh, Dr. Yeah. Demento. And there were so many great songs like Lex- Existential Blues mm-hmm. or Shel Silverstein's The Great Smoke Off. Oh, nice. Uh, well, in the lazy town of sunny San Rafael, there's a girl named Pearly Sweetcake. You probably knew her well. Well, she been stoned fifteen of. Oh yeah, well, shouldn't. <laughs> no, it's 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 a cover. It's it's a cover. We're fine. It's right. Fine. Actually, it's more of a sung poem. Yeah. There you go. And Shatner singing Rocket Man's pretty silly. Oh, I do love that one. I'm great. I'm a really big fan of the band Ninja Sex Party, um, and I think their music is hilarious. Do you know why? Um, Ninjas. Ninjas make everything better. Ninja Brian is awesome, and Danny Sexbang has the most incredible voice, and their music is just killer. the The first date song. If you haven't listened to that. Go to that YouTube video after this one. Richard Cheese, too. I like a lot of Richard Cheese. Oh, yeah, Cheese Richard Cheese is really fun, too. Oh, so much good stuff. Great question. What else? Mexican drug lord. All right. Can I get some good cocaine? <laughs> is there any advantage of rebooting the DCEU by recasting everyone? Like Wonder Woman, Superman, Shazam, or should they try and stick with who they got? Well, we talked about that at the top of the hour here. Yeah. I mean, I look, I think if they do it, there's always an advantage because you can do something, a new iteration of it. I mean, I look... I was a huge Justice League fan. In the mid-80s, they rebooted Justice League as a comedic yeah, version. Yeah, you've talked Keith, about this. I yeah, need to read this. It is so funny. But uh, it was also, it worked. I mean, it's goofy, but it was it was very legitimately funny. And I was like, you know, I was like, I'm not going to read this. Justice League and comedy. Yeah. So I was, I don't know what I was doing right there. But I didn't, um, <laughs> I didn't want to read it. But it was hilarious. And I loved it. So... I think if they rebooted something, it's it'd be tough, but they could. Yeah, it, it's always an option, right? I mean, we've had so many Batman, we've had so many Spider Man. You can always recast, but I feel like they did do a good thing with you know Shazam with Aquaman. Yeah. Do I want Jason Momoa to also be you know uh, in in a Superman property as Lobo? Yes, I do. Yes, I would like that. But you know, we'll see how that all pans out. I mean, Henry Cavill could be a good Batman. He could be. He absolutely could be. Also, I like when DC uses humor. I mean, on Weekly Hero, we we talked about a bunch of the like Brian Michael Bendis stuff. Right. And I love in Checkmate just how often like Green Arrow says stuff of like, no, I hang out here to take a dump. Like, I love those little moments where you're like, oh, they're superheroes, but also they're kind of dicks to each other who razz each other. I think that's fun. Uh, uh, yes, I like that. Yeah. It's true. Bry Guy says, that Black Adam trailer has me pretty hyped. And now that the movie is a month away, do you have any box office predictions? I think I'll cap it at six hundred million. Ooh. I think that's pretty ambitious. I think so too. I I I haven't seen enough in terms of the three trailers we've seen. Again, it's cool, but it looks like to me it looks like what I would expect from a Dwayne Johnson movie. Like I liked San Andreas, I liked it, mm-hmm. I enjoyed it, but I don't think it made six hundred million dollars. Maybe it did. I don't know. But it looks to me like your standard um, Dwayne Johnson movie. Yeah. It doesn't. There's nothing in it that makes me, oh, my God, I have to go see that. Because intellectually, there's not enough for me to grab on yet. It's just Dwayne Johnson being a superhero or an anti-hero kicking ass. Right. And so far, the only thing that's pretty interesting is, oh, okay. I mean, he's not being his normal charming self. Right. This is more of a brooding rock that we're seeing, right. which does intrigue me. But I think now that we live in a world where we've had so many superhero properties and now we're lampooning those properties, like the boys did such an excellent job with that, you know, the Dawn of the Seven trailer and everything in that right. movie footage. And that's what a lot of these things look like now. And so I feel like you got to up the ante, both DC and Marvel, because when the satirical stuff is matching your production value and sometimes bettering your stories got to change change things up. This is going to seem odd, but I look at that movie and if a character like Black Adam existed in the quote unquote real world, we don't get any sense that there's any peril to the real world in that trailer. It's he's in, completely in superhero land. Oh, there's the military and but like what would happen if you're like some accountant going to work in in the Midwest yeah. and a character like Black Adam shows up? Do you have any awareness of it? If he's like destroying New York City when you're going to work in, say, I don't know, Illinois somewhere, you know, Southern Illinois, Rock Island, do you feel it? Not that you have to, but I didn't get a sense from that trailer that there's any, that the real world cares. Mm-hmm. And is, is are they scared of him? Like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I, I know it's a weird thing, but I, I think that's the problem. 
superhero movies are only su super heroic if there is humanity to put them against. That's so well said. Yes, I you agree know, with that. Yes, and if, yes. if you don't have a human component to it, and now, you know, we're, we're saying here's the Justice Society and they're making these platitudes to they're appealing to Black Adam's sense of goodness or whatever. I don't want that. I want to know, like, what's going to happen when a woman on a street who has kids it, it can hit be, be hit by falling debris. Do we have a sense? It didn't. I didn't feel the real world was encroaching on this movie at all. Absolutely. Well, and that's that's a, a thing that one of my friends, uh, Mia Tapalia, an incredible actress. She's not as into the comic book movie stuff, so she'll check in with me about how things are working. And she just one day was like, you know what? I just I can't see New York City get destroyed in another movie where it's completely inconsequential. And I think that's something that, again, a lot of superheroes, both DC and Marvel, are just kind of are running into, like the Celestials we see in Marvel. And you Well, know, that's my Black problem. Adam. My problem with the MCU now, with this multiverse saga, at the end of Loki, it looked like reality itself was coming apart. All the branches, like, it looked more apocalyptic, and it had that feel like, I'm like, oh, shit. No consequences yeah. at all. You know, you get to London in Eternals, it's like, dang, 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 oh, there's a deviant. Oh, somebody took him out. Nobody mm -hmm. seems to care. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I don't get it. I don't feel that uh, even in Hawkeye, when you saw when you met Kate Bishop, she was talking about the Battle of New York when the Avengers, she watched things happen outside, even though she's very well to do. She is her money couldn't save her. Yeah. Her family's money couldn't save her. And she saw Hawkeye and, and there was a sense of and I really think that all Marvel movies should always be somehow grounded with the real world. And they've completely Thor love and thunder mm -hmm. totally. I mean, you could be like, Oh, Jane Foster was a human who's now dying of cancer, but it was inconsequential to the rest of yeah. us who cared. Exactly. So I'm hoping at least with this black Adam one that maybe they're just keeping everything close to the vest. Maybe there's some big surprises and that will will be really excited once we see this movie because I know you and I are still going to go there even though we of course haven't been I mean I'll be, I'm, it's a day one movie yeah, for me absolutely so we'll I mean, it looks cool I've always wanted to see a Black Adam movie so heck yeah I want it to be good mm -hmm. uh, Reamer Bulldog says tonight's episode of Shijo <laughs> is important because the last episode was okay episode five needs to be really good. I think it does. I really hope they rev it up. And I think they will. Titania, I believe. I believe. I mean, I want to get revved up like I get revved up watching these two ladies twerk, if you know what I'm saying. Easy, Rob. Easy. I don't understand. I'm listening to men complain about this scene. I'm like, guys. It's so fun. Where you want to be is in that room. It's so fun and cute. And frankly, if I could twerk, I would. Yeah. I'm like, where is there not anything good there? Yeah. I think this is wonderful. That's a soda fountain right there. <laughs> Uh, Reamer Bulldog says Ryan Coogler's direction. <laughs> Ryan Coogler directing Avengers Secret Wars is a great choice. Yes, we were talking about that earlier too. Of if you know Ryan Coogler is going to be doing all the other like big tentpole Avengers kind of stuff. Well, I think w if that's true, I think that says a lot about uh, Wakanda Forever. Yeah, yeah. And that was the thing that I'm because Wakanda Forever has a lot of in my mind has a lot of heavy lifting to do because if you're revealing quote unquote Atlantis or whatever they're going to call it. Um, you're revealing another secret world on our world. Again, what are the ramifications when the world finds out, oh, wow, we have a, a technologically advanced Wakanda that has just been re revealed to the rest of the world. Now we have another underwater secret society that's been here and they're going to go to war with Atlanta. Uh, Wakanda is going to go to war with Atlantis. I mean, mm -hmm. And there's 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 a celestial coming out of the water, and Eris Shem, the judge, is going to judge the Earth. The people of planet Earth, human beings, have got to be like, what the? What is happening? I mean, yeah, I, and there needs to be. There's going to be a lot of people in therapy. There's going to be people storming the Vatican, looking for answers for all this. I mean, humanity would be in an existential crisis, and that's another part of the MCU I'm not buying anymore. Mm -hmm. That humanity has been completely removed from this equation, and it's yeah. weird. That everyone's just kind of over at this point. Yeah. Like, ah, well, you know, it's a Tuesday. There's a God in the sky. No big deal. It's fine. What else we have? Brian Meadows says, don't believe young Avengers will be a thing, but that some younger heroes will become proper Avengers and the rest will be honorary Avengers during Secret Wars, like every person who fought in the battle at the end of Endgame. We don't even know where the Avengers are. Yeah. There's no Avengers right now. Right, there's no Avengers. Yeah. Feige said that too, as of right now. Like, that's not he did. a thing. And that's the thing. Like, where are the Avengers? And if there are Avengers, what's what who's, who's financing them? There's yeah. no, where's the base? Like, Has what? the compound just fallen apart? Is well, it just it's, filled with vagrants? It's just, yeah, just destroyed. I mean, it's such a weird. It's just Sam by himself, <laughs> testing out his wings, going back and forth. Like, what's going on there? 
I, I do think eventually we will have Young Avengers, though. I do, too. I think, why wouldn't you? Yeah. I, I think it's a great opportunity. They're putting their, they're, they are slowly building this yeah. Avengers team. We're seeing everyone's babies. We're going to get some young Avengers. It's going to happen. It is going to happen. So thank you, Brian Meadows, too, for that $20 super chat. We appreciate it. And also, I hope that your name is an SNL for reference, because that is great if it is. If it's your real name, that's awesome, too. What else? <laughs> uh, Dwan Williams, uh, one of four. One of uh, Hi, John and Rob and Chris. I think there may be some misconception about what the theme of the forging of the ring is about. It's not everyone getting together to shank Sauron, as Rob brought up yesterday. You suggest that, that is the shank? spectacle that the show will no doubt capture, but it is not what makes the Silmarillion the pinnacle of high fantasy. The forging of the ring is the final act of a Greek tragedy where heroic characters struggle against a fate of decline and unleash great evil in their doom battle against the inevitable fading it is a cautionary tale against tubers and trying to forestall the inevitable that structurally mirrors the bible okay yo let's back right up here's the thing all of that is true all of that is true but the end of the second age culminated with the war of the ring now i don't think we're going to get into all of those topics because that's what happens in the third age. You know, the the passing, everyone going to the into the West and all that. I mean, yes, all your what you're pointing out is absolutely true. But as far as the TV series goes, it's about shanking Sauron. And that's where we're leading up to. And yeah. and all of those other images and issues that you're bringing up mirroring the Bible. If I was if I was in college and discussing what are the literary uh, uh what what is going on in this story, absolutely correct. But when you're making a TV sh a series, an action adventure fantasy TV series. What is it that you're doing here? Yeah, I mean, we got to remember too the the works we're pulling from here and referencing all almost read like footnotes in a history book or you know in a in a theological class. And while that's super super interesting to read. Uh, talk lore and shop about, right? Really have these heady discussions about how they reflect modern mythology and everything as well. Does that work when you're executing a show? Yeah. I mean, I mean, look, the entire Lord of the Rings series, everything Tolkien wrote was all about him worrying about the loss of his way of life, the way of life. And that's exactly what Dwan says is absolutely true. Yes. The fact that the industrial age, the agrarian age is, is being destroyed is, and the industrial age is going to replace it. And the industrial age means we are going to lose our way of life. And that's exactly what Tolkien was worried about. Yeah. And that's you see that in the scouring of the Shire in Lord of the Rings. But there's a reason why the scouring of the Shire was not in Peter Jackson's movie. Yes. Because you couldn't do that. You would, you'd have an audience revolting. Um, they wouldn't be revolted. They'd be like, God damn it, you can't end the story How with the scouring of the Hobbit. Why, why, look at the why did you do that to the baby? Yeah, you can't do that. No. So, I mean, you have to ask yourself, what what is, but but Dwan is absolutely right. I oh, mean, absolutely. All, all of those themes are built and baked into Tolkien, and of course, he's basically his Catholicism. All yeah. of that was part of part of what's in the Bible. Yeah. And the books are him diving into his own existential dread about the way of life, his religion, and how much he likes linguistics. <laughs> that, that's, that's true. That's pretty much it. <laughs> he was a the man was a philologist. Yeah. What else we have? Uh, Richard K says, "Do you think we will ever get a Xena Warrior Princess big screen?" Or show Rebox. I'd love to see a Xena movie on the big screen with Sophia Butella as Xena. Ooh. That's pretty great casting. And Ooh. producer Jonathan Voiko has left the building. Bye. Time Have for fun more Warner Tales. Brothers meeting about Batman. Rework that, DCEU. Yeah, yeah. Sophia, that's actually great casting. I'd watch that movie. I would watch that too. I mean, I don't know if they'll I don't know if they'll bring it to the big screen, but I could see them doing a uh, like a streaming reboot. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's a story that definitely would play to audiences. Xena's a badass. Yeah. Xena is who is one of two women I usually reference to to my buddy Travis at our training sessions where I'm like, I want to look like Xena or I want to be a Bond villain who can kill men with her legs. You know what, Chris? After uh -huh. you see Aliens with yeah. Rob and I, you will also be seeing Sigourney Weaver. Oh, I love Sigourney Weaver. There we go. You know, you could do a new Xena series with Lucy Lawless. You could. There's no reason why you, yeah, you know, maybe she's Queen Xena. Ooh, there we go. You know, that'd be she fun. She kicks ass. Yeah, and we are training some new warriors, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, perhaps. Uh, Josh Becker says November and December are stacked month for movies. Yeah, uh, they are. Month for movies. Which, yes. I mean, is going to be great once we get there. But right now, 
uh, it's a little it's a little more far and few between. There's a lot of movies opening this weekend that no one's going to go see. Yeah. I, I want to go see, see how they run. I think that looks fun. I think I'm going to watch Chef's Table Pizza again. <gasps> oh, my God. I love Chef's Table. This Chef's Table Pizza is one of the great seasons. I didn't dig the dude in, as much in Japan. It was kind of weird. Mm -hmm. It was all subtitled, but then when you got to the Japanese uh, section, it was all dubbed. Yeah. The characters, it was weird. I wanted, because mm -hmm. I love listening to Japanese just because I grew up listening. I don't know why they did that, but man, that show's beautifully shot. Yeah. It's so great. They need to give an Emmy out for cinematography because that show would win. It would. All of Netflix's food stuff right now is just top tier. Man, so watch good. Chef's Table. Yes. Pizza. Mm hmm. What else? All right. So we're going to start with the Sam Fisher one and two, and then we'll go back to Daryl Best. Sam Fisher one and two. I saw someone say that Titania might not even be able to sue for the name She Hulk because it's not like Jen is selling merch with the name. Jen has even. Uh, publicly denounce the name. The person Titania should sue is GLKNH, and that's only if GLKNH is marketing that She Hulk is on staff. Is that right? Well, I mean that's that's probably true because She Hulk's not. She doesn't call herself that. Other people have called herself that. Yeah. Well, and this is the thrust of the the episode tonight. Um, oh, Taylor, do you mind if you put up the spoiler thingy? Can we do that? I don't know if we have a spoiler. Do we not have that on this side? On this one. In this studio? Not spoil anything, That's then. okay. The clip that was released about this show is arguing why Jennifer should not and cannot be sued for the usage of this name, oh. basically. Well, there you go. So we are going to get into that tonight and we'll talk about all of that tomorrow. Well, you all will talk about it. I won't be here for the after show. Sad. Yeah, that's okay. We'll talk about it later. We will. All right. By God. <laughs> Uh, Daryl Best Wadley says, I hope the plot of Cap 4 doesn't have anything to do with his race. The show already did that. I want to walk out on this movie going, Steve Rogers, who? Ooh, I mean, I love that Steve Rogers, who kind of take on this. I think it's hard to not discuss, though, because that was a big part of why people weren't willing to accept Sam. Not only was he reluctant and he didn't feel like he should step into Cap's shield and everything, even though he gave it to him. He had a whole bunch of his own um, internalized thoughts about it, internalized racism about how like he's not the guy that people want to see for Captain America. And then he embraces that. And I know the show did talk about it, but I feel like it is going to be, you know, this kind of little dog ear on his story because people are going to treat him very differently. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I mean, I understand why people might want to shy away from politics, but I thought one of the great things about Captain America and Winter Soldier was Isaiah Bradley and Sam Wilson's debate. You know, I, Isaiah Bradley was uh, the heart of that show for me and why I loved I loved the series a lot more than I guess a lot of other people did. It leaned into that miniseries, The Truth. And the fact is, you know, I think one of the really compelling ideas about this country is, who are we? You know, who do we... Uh, th there's a lot of people that want to tell you what and what America is. and And I think that at the heart of Sam Wilson becoming Captain America, that question is, who is Captain America? Who does he represent? What is America? And if you have somebody leading America as Captain America, what does that mean? And I think it's inherent. It's baked in. See, to me, it, it isn't somebody like injecting their politics into something where it shouldn't be there. This is baked into the very concept of Sam Wilson becoming Captain America. And I, for one, I, I love delving into those issues. Because, Absolutely. Because that, the whole thing is the fact that part of the thing that makes Sam Wilson a hero is he will, as Captain America... He will defend people that hate him. And that to me is heroic. Absolutely. Well, that's what actual bravery is, right? Doing things when you're scared, doing things in the face of adversity. And this goes back to grounding these superhuman, super stakes movies is taking it to a humanistic level and making it reflect the real world. Because if it doesn't reflect our actual realities, and sure, sometimes we want escapism in our shows and our films and everything. I sure. get that. But that's what gets you to have a real personal investment in it when you care about these characters and their struggles. And, uh, you know, it's funny. To me, you know, it's one thing if you want to inject unnecessary political uh, messaging in oh, something. Oh, for sure. I hate that. I'm like, why are you doing that? This is it's baked in. And that's why I think if anything can delve into politics of all of all kinds, this can be part of that. You know, and it's 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 like when you watch uh, any movie, you know, 48 Hours, Nick Nolte and, and, and Eddie Murphy developing a friendship despite their differences. Mm -hmm. Part of part of what's fun about that movie is seeing the racial issue come into play and a guy racist cop 
learn to become friends with Eddie Murphy or respect him. I like shit like that. Yeah. It's part of the story. And that's, to me, that's an American story. Mm -hmm. Oh, I completely agree. Well done. What else? Uh, Josh Becker says, Babylon, oh, dude, you and me both. Babylon is my most anticipated movie. It looks like a mix of Wolf of Wall Street, Great Gatsby, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It will get many Oscar noms. Josh, uh, I am right there with you, you know? And, I mean, come on, look at this. I, I, I want to I party with her. Yeah. On Christmas Day. There, there are whole, like, on-set shenanigans that we see in those trailers. It looks so, so good. I wow. mean, this looks like it's going to be a wild and visually stunning film. Margot Robbie and Brad Pitt, come on. You can't go wrong. I know. I'm telling you, bring on the filthy. Mm-hmm. What's next? Richard K says, what are your thoughts on the Michael York, Oliver Reed, Three Musketeers movies directed by Richard Lester? The Three and Four Musketeers, I love them. They're great. Who doesn't love those movies? If you haven't seen him, by the way, Richard Lester directed uh, Help and also directed Superman 2. But he directed, actually, I believe the Saul Kinds, who produced the Superman movies, produced those movies as well. And like Superman the movie and Superman 2, they were made together. And then they were released as as the Three Musketeers and the Four Musketeers. That's very cool. Wonderful films. Wonderful films. Very, very good. Love them. Watch them. (laughs) Um, uh, Richard K. says, what are your thoughts on the 2008 John Woo movie Red Cliff? Well, Richard K., would it surprise you to know that I have both Red Cliff movies on Blu-ray? What? And I love them. I mean, come on, John Woo period piece movies. Give give me a break. Uh, I mean, get, I, have, I, I have never seen these. Can you give me like a quick take on what these are? War in China. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> period <laughs> War in China. That's yeah. all you need to know. Let's go. Let's watch uh, that. And it, they're great. I mean, I, I'm a huge John Woo fan. And again, you know, that was part of his period. He came to America. He'd made these great Hong Kong movies. But then... The Americans didn't know what to do with him. Universal hires him to make Hard Target with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Then he turns in his cut, and they're like, what's all the slow motion? What's all the doves flying? And they're like, we don't like the way it's cut. And they literally recut the whole movie and turned it into, it's all right. It's a service, It's a good Jean-Claude Van Damme film. But if you get to see his original director's cut, which I used to have on VHS, you, it, they just released it on a, on a French, the French Hard Target Blu-ray. It's like a real... John Woo movie. Oh. And then he made Broken Arrow with Christian Slater and, <gasps> and um, John Travolta. And they mm-hmm. kind of locked him out of the edit bay on that one as well. Oh, because a lot of this, he does slow motion. It wasn't really until the first real American John Woo movie was Face Off. That was the closest thing when you had Nicolas Cage and, and John Travolta in that. Uh, that was the, to me, that's the only real American John Woo movie. And then he went back to China and he ended up making things like Red Cliff. Okay, very cool. Thank you for explaining that. All right, what's up? Josh Becker says, I binged Barry this year and it's just so great. Oh, are you all caught up on Barry? I am caught up on Barry. That's so good. It's so great. It's so wonderful. Uh, Henry Winkler is just the nicest human being too. I love him. I love him so much. We ran into him at Universal and he was just so kind and so sweet. You Took the time him. to talk to my friends. It was wow. really, really kind. And then Bill Hader. I'm so happy that he is just thriving as a creator and performer. Oh, he's so good. And he's really coming to his own as a director on that series, too. Gosh. He directed the Chase episode. Yes. That was amazing. (laughs) Have you heard him talk about it? Yes. He's just like, anytime that I can get a stuntman in a helmet, I'm going to, so I don't have to do things and do that, have them go do it. But that Chase scene is so So good. good. Oh, wonderful stuff. It is so good. Glad you're all caught up in Barry. Caught up on Barry. Daryl Best Wadley says, no one is talking about Abbott Elementary in the Emmys. It's inspiring to see Quinta Brunson win one after getting her start on YouTube. Hell hey, yeah. you know, I heard her actually on um, on um, NPR talking. Yeah, and she, she did. She was doing comedic stuff on. She was really interesting. I thought it was great. And yeah, but I think that uh, Cheryl Lee Ralph. Yes. Come on, her, her speech. Her acceptance speech ch- chills. One of my favorite things ever. Well, and I, because I, I listened to the Dreamgirls soundtrack growing up too, so I love her. She's in Sister Act too, as you know, the very, very yep. like stoic. Don't you sing choirs and how you're going to make money, Lauren Hill? I no, love I, her. It's great, and you know what I, the lesson that there is that YouTube can be a launching point if you're a talented individual and you can get your talent out there, you never know what's going to lead. Oh, yeah. You look at, Quincy, you look at, you know, Anna Akana. You, there's a ton of people who have done really, really incredible stuff. Uh, Game Grumps, you know, Aaron is doing voiceover now. Yep. It really can be a great launching point. Yep. So that's why, you know, when so many people write into John about, like, asking, how do I get started? How do I do this? 
get started. Just now. get started and start making stuff and you'll probably make some mistakes, but just magic school bus it. Take chances, <laughs> get messy, make mistakes, man. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> it's hard work, though. It is hard work. Yeah. Perseverance. Mm-hmm. Ain't going to happen right away. Uh, Josh Becker said, I'm seeing the Woman King and see how they run tomorrow. Well, that's a great double bill. That I is. really hope the, the the Woman King is great. It looks, I mean, come on. Look that, that looks picture. so Look intense. Gosh. Wow. I mean, probably the greatest actress we have at this moment. She's so good. She is so incredible. This movie looks very, very intense. Very, very cool. John Boyega is really coming into his own right now, too. And that and the movie, I forget, which I'm dying to see. Breaking. Breaking. I can't wait to see it. I can't. I don't. It's funny because I keep forgetting about it. Like, there's some movie I want to see. I'm like, it's breaking. That's the movie I want to see. Peter's not playing it. Yeah, I know. I got to figure out where to go see it. Oh, man. Damn it. Enjoy those movies, bud. That's awesome. What else we have? Flover99 says, Hi, John. The DCEU has been a hit and miss over the years. When we look back, was Snyder the wrong man to launch the DCEU with Man of Steel and Batman v, Batman v Superman? I mean, I don't... I don't think he was the wrong man to do it because he has a vision. Like, you know, I always go about... A lot of people just didn't... Look, his, his brand of the DCEU was not necessarily what people wanted. And I think a lot of the time they have not, you have to look at the movie for what it is, not what it what it isn't. And I think there's a lot of really interesting, great imagery in those movies, but they're more like an art piece than, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say he's the wrong guy to do it. I think that he was not the guy who people wanted. That his vision of the characters were not what people wanted for the characters. That's fair. But if you give yourself over to what he did, I mean, there's a lot of goofiness in Batman v Superman. I like the Ultimate Edition better, but there's a lot of goofiness in it. But I like the operatic nature of all of it, the the painterly quality that he brought to it. I mean, it's it's. I, I really believe that people want to see superheroes in our world because if the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when when it's in New York, it's like in New York. Yeah. So you, oh, it's the real world. But like Tim Burton before him, Zack Snyder's Man of Steel and Batman v Superman and Justice League take place in a... It's a different world. It's a different world. It's not ours. It's not ours. And that's fine. But yeah, I think, because I mean, like in Shang-Chi, one of the best things is that bus scene. And right. just having actual people, the guy live streaming. Speaking right. of buses. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't fast enough to get it on the last one. I love her so much. I base all of my teaching around her. (laughs) I shrink my students. No, not really. There you go. Yeah. What else? Reamer Bulldog says, Kansas fight in Man of Steel is one of the greatest action sequences in comic book movie history. Well, see, the juxtaposition. Reamer Bulldog says this right away. I, I think you're right. I mean, the thing that I love about what Zack Snyder did in Man of Steel is he showed the consequences of what would really happen if Kryptonian figures that were this powerful would battle the carnage would be enormous the destruction in metropolis would be horrific yeah i mean we we think yeah they're gonna get in a fight no the thing about Zack snyder is he reminded you if kryptonians got into a fight in a major motion or a major a metropolitan area many 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 people would die absolutely and superman can't save anyone when you're in the midst of battling somebody, can you imagine? That's like asking if you're in a, 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 a boxing ring with Mike Tyson and you saw like somebody getting mugged over in the corner, would you get criticized if you're fighting Mike Tyson and you couldn't go over and save that dude? You have to, Mike Tyson would destroy Keep you. Keep those mitts up. That's right. Yeah. You got to do that. Anyway. Just that's my him. thought. Right, Your him. mileage may vary. Richard K says, I've just seen all three episodes of Rings of Power and it's been a bit slow for me. I wanted more action, but two things... One will see Sauron schooling fools at some point and is the guy who fell to Middle Earth, Gandalf. Thank you for that $20 support, Richard, first of all. Very nice. I mean, I it is inevitable that Sauron will be in this at some point, right? Because of the buildup. He's our big bad. One of the things we talked about on the show today was the tangibility of Sauron, where he's most effective when he's a concept and a fear and an entity as opposed to a corporeal being. Um, Because an idea, as we know through history and literature, an idea is more powerful than a man. You can't kill an idea, right? So we'll see him at some point. The guy, the stranger, do you think that's Gandalf? Yes. You do? Because you know why? They need some kind of star power. See, that's... I mean, it's got to be Gandalf because otherwise they're going to need that connection. And most people... Look, the general audiences for this show 
are not steeped in the works of Tolkien. No, they have not read the Legendarium. Like, <laughs> yeah, they don't even they they don't know anything about this. Yeah. So, and, and they can't be expected to. And and Gandalf is somebody you need. Gandalf is the one. He's the he's the Pete Maverick. The way Pete Maverick is Pete Maverick, and he, that's Top Gun. Oh, thank you. I was like, yeah. if you're gonna make Top Gun Maverick, okay. you gotta have Maverick in it. You gotta have and that's and. Fair. and the a regular audience is going to go Big well, brain fart. why isn't gandalf in this and people kind of like well you know okay. he's thousands of years old and he didn't come yeah. to middle earth until i i definitely have murder. felt a bit douchey when my friends have been like that's gandalf right now well actually this is the second age and so he's not going to arrive until the third so he's probably a blue wizard one of the other velar and and then i can just see my friend's faces gloss over i'm like but maybe it's gandalf yeah, well, that's maybe. <laughs> that's the problem. Can you imagine trying to explain to an audience the difference between a blue wizard and what Gandalf is? Exactly. Who the Astari are or whatever? You yeah. don't even, like, you couldn't. Because they have so many names that are the same thing, too. My my biggest criticism of, of the Rings of Power is that in three hours, we're not very far along in a story. There's not a lot of story to, if you were to recount what was going on, you could recount it in about five seconds. Yeah. It's it's three hours long. And that's the law that's the length of you're longer than Fellowship the theatrical of Fellowship of the Ring. And a lot happened in Fellowship of the Ring. Sure in did. this, in this, it feels like the pieces are you could have done to me, you could have done this story the way Rings of uh, the way House of the Dragon does. You could have done the story in an hour. The first hour. Probably. Because you could have juxtaposed you could have juxtaposed if you're gonna play with time anyway. Galadriel's quest and finding going and finding the castle could have been juxtaposed with homeboy in the south finding these orcs. Yeah. And you you realize like, oh, there is an evil on the move throughout Middle Earth. There's congruency here. We can see all these pieces coming into play. You're, yeah, and, you, and then and then she would come back, meet with meet with um what you call it? Elrond. Uh, Elrond, Elrond goes to the dwarves. Mm -hmm. It could have all happened in the first episode. Probably. I don't mind the pacing. I just do think that it needs to be a tighter edit, and some things are repetitive. And the problem is, it. we already get it. Yeah. They're acting like we've never been in Middle Earth before, and we we do. We've got six other movies, seven if you include Ralph Bakshi's, or eight if you include the Return of the King yeah. TV version. We get it, mm -hmm. and it's it's that. Whereas House of the Dragon, somebody else earlier talked about the pacing. I mean. We also get that. Yeah, you're right in there. So, is this a blue wizard? <laughs> That's three blue wizards. Those are all wizards. blue wizards, Taylor. You did great. Thank you. Very Perfect. well done. No notes. <laughs> Hitchcock is the goat. Says, I love when you random title things. When I heard Ram Harbuckle and the Mystery of Espionage in reference to Secret Invasion on your podcast, I laughed so hard I almost drove through my garage door. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're glad you didn't. Hitchcock is the goat. Gosh. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah. We, we throw out these crazy references and we allow, they, they can fall where they may. We try to give you the chuckles. It's true. That's why, that's why we're paid the median bet bucks. That's why this <laughs> stuff like this happens. Yeah. This is the highbrow <laughs> shit, you guys. Wow. <laughs> uh, Haunted Autumn says, Clerks 3 is a triumph. An old school human drama gloriously lathered in Kevin Smith isms. A joyous theatrical experience. Love the show. You know, Dan Merle, who I really like a lot, Dan Merle, um, he gave Clerks 3 a great review too. I've only heard good things about it. I've only it. heard good things about it. I've heard that it's very meta and self-referential and just so heartfelt, and I love Kevin Smith. And it sticks to landing. Yeah, I'm hyped. Excited to see that one too. I'm too. I'm a very hyped. Uh, Dennis sends in a $50 super chat. Dennis! My God, all the way from Germany. Germany who's going to get their, their gas cut off by Putin. Oh no! <laughs> Um, Dennis, take your money back. No, uh, we'll take it. Thanks, <laughs> okay. Dennis. Appreciate it. Dennis says, hello, everyone. Just sending some love and a big thank you for all the great content. All the best from Germany. Do you know what Germany so has been nice. killing it lately and doing? What? Physical media. Oh, how so? They Go put on. out, the Germans put out, first of all, they have the highest QC standards in the world, even higher than the Japanese, which means they really demand you to, it's got to be a good transfer. Mm -hmm. But they do these media books. Now the they they're these really nice heavy thick like they're like books and they um, come with the disc and everything in the movie but but pages and pages of books mm -hmm. uh, booklet and pictures and behind the scenes interviews and all that and you can use a Google app and just it'll translate it immediately you can just pass over the that's amazing I know 
So that is actually really cool. If more physical media gave me stuff like that, I think I'd probably be more on board because I, I do love a steel book. Like I my avatar, the last airbender steel book that Nickelodeon gave me. Thanks, guys. It came with, you know, like part of the Kyoshi novel and just really oh, yeah. beautiful art that came with it. And the actual DVD set itself is beautiful and displayed in my home. I have the most gorgeous box set from Germany of American Werewolf in London. Ooh. It's amazing. And uh, for those of you who might not know, I do a weekly show called Let's Get Physical Media with my friend Dieter Bastian in Saarbrücken, Deutschland. So you should tune into that. That's Sunday mornings on my channel, The Post Geek Singularity, 11 a.m., where we share physical media. And he's the one I always call up and go, yo, I need the Coke uh, Dune set. And he sent it to me. Oh, what a he's, guy. He's, I met him because what a mensch. I, I met him because I needed the five disc rollerball set that was only released in Germany. Oh, and he got it for me that. And then he's we started your doing he's your dealer. He is my German physical media facilitator. Nice. You got to have a guy. I got to have a guy. Yeah, nice Saarbrück plug, too. That was done seamlessly. You like that? Oh, that was great. What a hey, pro. Dennis hooked me up. He t Dennis teed me up and there you go. You know, hole in one. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Thanks for supporting the channel in Absolutely, that way as well. Absolutely, Dennis. We appreciate you. Jared Vester says, I got my Return of the Jedi Emperor Palpatine and his Imperial Guard Pop bobbleheads today for my desk. You guys like Pops? Have any favorites? Oh, I think the Pops are cute. I don't know if I'd want the Emperor, though, as a bobblehead being like kind of a cute little chibi character. Yeah, I do want to get the Pops of Superman and Lois from Superman those the Those sounded really cute. Uh, yeah, I got to get those because they're flying. Mm -hmm. But I think my favorite pop that I have is Mads Mikkelsen as Hannibal Lecter. Oh, that's a good one. I really love, we've got a Blue Beetle and Buster Gold that I adore, but I have a soft spot for it. We've got Andy Dwyer and April Ludgate from The Office, and those were our wedding cake toppers. Oh, wow. Yeah. Pops make good wedding cake toppers. They really do. They really do. It's easy to get the cake off of them. You just wash that shit off. It's great. I have one that big Arisham the Judge that's on John's desk. Yeah. I kind of want to hang it from the ceiling. <gasps> by the neck there he is <laughs> oh my God. just have him neck. looming no you gotta have he's him on loom. wires yeah, yeah so he's up he's in the sky looming. Ooh, i think that's a great idea dwan williams says the mad king was cut so many times that people called him king scab Ew. while Aegon the unworthy flat out refused to sit on it meanwhile jaharis sat the throne for 60 years without ever being hurt people liked him i guess well we'll we'll see how that all pans out in the show version. Right. But that is interesting about how one king is just like, I'm not going to sit in that chair. Got, and someone else is just like, just don't hurt yourself. Uh, yeah, don't hurt you. Yeah, and didn't. 60 yeah. years of, uh, it's fine. I like this chair. You know, I think it's because Viserys, he, he's a chill guy. He wants to just kind of hang. Right. He keeps, and, oh, yeah, shit. You can't, you can't lounge in the Iron no. Throne. That's not going to happen. How about some cushions? Truly. Like, Truly. why not? Get some you little, bring a cushion. I'm on a cushion right now. Yeah. And my my butt is so pampered at this moment. It's wonderful. It's true. Um, there was a part one to that one. Sorry, I didn't know that. Oh. 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 Um, okay, Dwan Williams says part one. Fun fact. <laughs> the Iron Throne has a history of actively murdering unworthy kings. Joff was cut on it. Magor the Cruel was impaled on it. The Mad King was cut so many times that people called him King Scab, while Aegon the Unworthy flat out refused to sit on it. I'm, I'm going around the camera. There we go. Yeah. Meanwhile, Jaehaerys sat on the throne for 60 years without ever being hurt. Um, Why I think do that's, people sit in this chair? Because it's cool. They look cool sitting in it. I get, man. Boys will be boys, I guess. Come on, y'all. You don't have to be tough by sitting in a chair made out of knives. I just, I worry what would happen if a woman sat on that throne. I just, I, I don't like to sit in an uncomfortable chair in my house. Like a lazy boy that's busted, I refuse to be in it. An iron throne sounds horrific. Full of swords. Full of swords. It's like, it's like the worst thing you could ever be on. I'm not a fan. I don't understand why people do it. I understand it's an intimidation thing and it looks really cool, but like, eh. No. Yeah. And also chat. Yeah, symbolism. I get it. But uh, CJ Rebirth says, I rewatched Crazy Rich Asians. I still want the sequel. We're getting one. You know, yeah, we are getting one. Yeah. I like that movie and Gemma Chan's in it. Yeah, well, and it's focus. The sequel's focused on Gemma Chan's character, yeah. which is going to be great because it's following oh, man, the I, I, I would focus my entire life on Gemma Chan. She is such a stunning human being, such an incredible actress. I love her voice. Oh, it's so soothing. I, I would just like her to tell me what she went to the grocery store and bought. Yeah. If she had a sleep app, I would download oh, that. Oh, man. So much money. It, uh, she's just so comforting. Gosh, love her voice. Mm. Love her. Mm -mm -mm. 
Jared Vester says, I agree that Viserys has been a bit weak as a king, but can we all agree that when you compare him to the kings and queens in Game of Thrones, like Joffrey, Cersei, Daenerys, that he's probably the best king? <laughs> I mean, comparatively, personality-wise, well, he's sure. I, uh, but as a king, he's still lame. Like, he should know better. And the problem is, I think he shirked his responsibilities because he's rather like, he's he pushes stuff off. Mm-hmm. Nah, we're not going to deal with the stepping st- stepping stones. Well, nah, we're not going to do that. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah. He- so you can be, you don't have to be murderous to be a bad king. I, I mean, I think he's a benevolent man. Yes. I think he's a good man. He has a good heart. But as a king, like, he he's not decisive. He is not a leader. Absolutely. I would love for him to be a council member. And I think that's kind of how he saw his life's trajectory going anyway. He even talks constantly about how, you know, Damon's the warrior. Damon was probably mom, mother's favorite, all this other stuff. He doesn't see himself as kingly. He sees it as something that was thrust upon him. But I mean, yeah, he's much nicer than Cersei and all those other folks. He's not murdering prostitutes for fun like Joffrey. But he definitely needs to have much more of a backbone to be a leader and to do what needs to be done for Westeros. And the fact that he didn't see his brother as a super weapon, like his amoral party boy brother, he could have used him more and wielded wielded him as a tool Mm -hmm. more than he should have. But he listened to Otto. He listened to Otto Hightower. Yeah. And now everyone's gunning for him. Everyone, this week's episode's going to be so good. I'm so excited. he's going to die. Oh, absolutely. All right, what else? Uh, Don Dwan Williams says, wonder what John feels about the legal scenes in She-Hulk thus far. Would those arguments hold up in court? Uh, you know, I, I I don't know about that. I haven't been looking forward to. I, I, don't, I don't look at She-Hulk for sound legal advice. For that, I look for Alan Shore at uh, Boston Legal. Oh, yeah, with Danny Crane. That's Ab- right. Obviously. My dad, actually, my dad is a, uh, or was a corporate attorney. He now teaches law. By the way, that's um, great CG. It's such great CGI. Thank you. Um, you. You did such a good job, Taylor. I'm so glad you're animating that show and working here. Look at the hair. Um, it's beautiful there. Sometimes it's uncanny. This yeah. is really, really nice. Yeah. But my, my dad's worked in law for years and years and years. He's written for Forbes and stuff, too, as a legal consultant. And he loves this show. He adores oh. She-Hulk, and he'll text me about it, too, to like catch up on it. But he thinks all the legal stuff so far has been very fun and wacky. Oh, so okay. From, from one lawyer, he's enjoying it. Well, I there you go. For all. I'll speak to, uh, if, if uh, that's, that's all Jeff I need Carr to Jeff Carr's seal of approval, so, you know, wow. that's pretty cool. Then it's good. And he's a rad dude. And he knows. Yeah. Dwan Williams says, imagine what Viserys felt like when he told Rhaenerys to go find someone she loves, and she brings back Damon while secretly banging Crispin. Well, that's, you know, that's that's what a father does. Oh, teenage girls, we love to just test our boundaries. Or, 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 or you know, uh, uh, Taylor wanted me to do this. This is, I can imagine Viserys thinking sometimes when he talks to, to Renera, it's like this. Look at, look at the bags under my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Bad daughter? Good daughter. <laughs> This is quality content. For those of you listening on the podcast, there enjoy you go. that moment. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, what? What's happening? <laughs> you really did have to be here. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, I'm not even supposed to be here today. Says, do you prefer Trent Reznor as a composer or singer? Ooh. Ooh. Um, you know what? I I really like Nine Inch Nails and I really like Trent Reznor. Yeah. Um, but I think he's... I. Uh, He's great as a composer too. Like I loved his score for the Social Network, mm-hmm. and they did. He did a great score for uh, for for Fincher. He's been he did uh, um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but then he yep. scored Watchmen, which was really really good. He did such beautiful work on that. Unbelievable. I I just really like him too. The whole whenever he was like, "This is Johnny Cash's song now. Like this is not ours at all." He's just he's just a classy dude, and yeah. I love his music. I do too. I'm a fan. Uh. Joseph Maez says, have you guys seen Cobra Kai season five thoughts? I have not yet. I have not seen any Cobra Kai. Oh, well, see, I I have not seen five up to four. I've really enjoyed it. All right. My friends really like it. And I, I, I have watched some of the Karate Kid films, so I feel like I should catch up on it. Do you well, like it? I do. Okay. I do. I think it's a great way to revive a franchise. Sweet. It's good. Cool. It's a lot of fun. It's heartfelt. Richard K says, best rapper turned actor, Ice Cube. Tupac, Common, 50 Cent, LL Cool J, or any others you can think of? Ooh, Ooh. that's a good one. I mean, I think you know the answer. I know the answer? Yeah, best rapper turned actor. I mean, for me, it'd be be Ice-T. Wrong. 
Rob? <laughs> well, Eminem's pretty good. Wrong. Queen Latifah. Oh, oh Queen you know Latifah what? Is you know amazing. what? You're probably she right. Is better than everyone. I, I think. I think you might be right about that. I do love her. She's. That's she's, the biopic I she, want. Plus, I have a thing. I have a crush on her. Oh, as you should. She's gorgeous. Yeah, so she is gorgeous. Chicago. Oh, there you go. There. Wow. Right. Queen Latifah. Nice. I just really like Ice T on Law and Order SVU. I think he's great. And yeah, yeah. Oh, Ice T is great. No, I, Ice T, New Jack City. Mm. Got all the way back to seventies, man. I mean, uh, uh, the eighty seven. Eighty seven is not the seventies. <laughs> New Jack City was eighty seven, I think. That's when I was made. Um, <laughs> Rich, that's when you were made. Yeah. Wow, you were minted in eighty seven. I was minted in eighty seven. Wow, mm -hmm. that's terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> Richard K says, "Are we getting another Born movie?" I don't know. They probably. I can imagine at might. some point. I mean, I, I know for one, I've been like, man, I'm really missing some white boys jumping through windows. Give me a born movie, man. I got to tell you, from an editorial standpoint, the third born movie, the born supremacy, mm -hmm. the way that actually did something new cinematically that I hadn't seen before. That's the way it's cut, well, the way it's cut so quickly, and yet you never. They tried to emulate the way those movies are edited with the James Bond movie Quantum of Solace. It doesn't work because you can't. It's not just you have to shoot it as fast as that movie is edited. You never not know where you are. Greengrass was a genius. He created a whole new style that I thought would be adapted more, but it hasn't because you have to understand how to shoot it. It's not just editorially, but anyway, that's just an aside. That's very, very cool. That's insightful. Oops. Oh, Okay. Dangerous Lee says, hi, Chris and Rob. E.T. turns 40 this year. <laughs> What's your best favorite scene? Thanks. Oh. Oh my God. There's so many great scenes. I love so most many. of ET. I mean, look, the f it's it's cliche, but when the bikes take yeah, off, it's magical. As I hell. mean, that is magical. That's beautiful. Um, but I do love, I do love the scene when Elliot first goes into like the shed and meets mm -hmm. ET for the first. I mean, I mean, I'm an unabashed ET lover. Yeah. I, I, every scene in that movie is absolutely divine. Drew Barrymore finding E.T. is a, a great moment, too. Great. That scream back and forth between them is lovely. That movie, though, too, like that, when my parents finally showed it to me, the the military stuff scared me so much. Oh, and rightfully so. It was so terrifying. And I really like Peter Coyote. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the military leader who's mm -hmm. trying to, like, trying to bro down with 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 Henry, you know, trying yeah. to, Elliot's going, look, this is how it, I, it's it's just a, it's a great, it's great such film. a well-done movie. Gosh. So good. Happy birthday, E.T. Happy birthday, E.T. Sadu says, uh, John David Washington, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Penn Badgley, Timothy Oliphant, Bill Hader, Raul Coley, Jason Sudeikis are on the Reed Richards shortlist. My pick is Joseph Gordon-Levitt. You? Joseph Gordon-Levitt would make a good Reed Richards, but again, I don't know if he's old enough. I see, I see, and Penn Badgley's too young, too. They have baby faces. I love Raul Coley as... As Reed, I think that's great. That's a casting. great idea. I love, love, love. That's that a dude. great idea. I'd buy that. Oh, if you're not following him on Twitter, he's a fun follow. I do not follow him. Oh, he's great. Half the time too, it's him just like painting Warhammer figurines, and I'm just like, yeah, man. Wow, you're great. I want to be What army with does you. he does he play? Do you know? I don't know. See, I, I just oh. I've never gotten into Warcraft or uh, uh, Warhammer 40k, but I do want a Harlequin army. They have a Harlequin army. That would be the army that I would I would get, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to dive, make the dive into Warhammer because yeah. I know how much it would cost if I wanted to get a whole army, and I would because I'm obsessive that way. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's an aside. I don't know what that means. No, I but. get that. That was another thing my dad was really into. He loved doing the miniatures paintings, so that's the only kind of scope I have on him. All right. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so Richard K says, question for Rob as a massive Bond fan. Rob, I recently watched George, La George Lazenby Bond, and he was very good, and the movie was very good. Why did he only do one? Well, because he didn't want... I love Honor Majesty's Secret Service, but George Lazenby was not an actor. He was a model. And the pressure of doing what he had to do and how he was expected to do all this press, he didn't dig it. And he didn't really get along with the Broccoli's, and so he only did one, unfortunately. But there's a great documentary about him i think it's called being bond watch it it's great and uh, he got into some trouble he was he was like hosting a james bond special or something and he's 83 years old he made some comments that were seen as being not politically correct Ooh. and they removed oh it was you know what it was it was a uh, like a symphonic of all the bond music and he, oh, he hosted it very cool and he said some things that were deemed to be not politically correct and he got removed oh, from Georgie. the tour. Oh, my gosh. He's 83, man. Yeah. That movie is worth it just for Diana Rigg alone. Oh, my God. Gosh, one of my favorite. so good in it. One of my favorite uh, 
Bond movies. Mm-hmm. Favorite Bond score. One of my favorite Bond girls. Yeah. Ticks a lot of boxes. She needs a man to dominate her. <laughs> that's what her dad says. Anyway. Of course, that's the line that you pull out as the sound by Robert. <laughs> Not that. I was talking about non-politically correct things. Mm. Chef Rigo. Chef Rigo. Says saying hi while eating mozzarella sticks with you know how dare you chef yeah man you are such a wonderful chef how dare you do this culinary abomination to Terrible. yourself well just just cream on cream beige on beige i'm not no there's no flavors Didn't melding well it. together they're not lifting each no like Part jonathan Boyko no. said i want the acidic taste that comes with the marinara exactly. sauce you gotta balance out that cheese yeah baby. man come on that's okay we're, we're still friends chef we still love you we love shogun all right. Anything else, Taylor? That's it. That's, That's it. it. We're, we're ending on mozzarella sticks. Yay. Just leaving <laughs> disappointed. What can you do? Man. All right. Well, despite that, I had fun doing this with you, Rob. I always have fun working with you, Chris, you know, because it doesn't feel disappointing in a place like this. It doesn't. There's shows no heartbreak. With you. There's, zero There's no heartbreak, heartbreak in a place like this. No. You can also always catch me and Rob doing the Weekly Hero, which we have just brought back. So you can come see that on Mondays. We're dropping those episodes at night. Obviously, tomorrow there will be another John Campia show, bright and early. I'm not going to be on that one. I'm going to have Tuesdays and Thursdays off, which is very Ooh. exciting. Ooh. Um, but everyone else will be here. We'll have the lovely Amy Newman on with you guys. So... With that all down, thank you to everyone who sent in our super chats. We can't do these without you. We have to answer your questions. Otherwise, it's just me and Rob talking at you and making Taylor film. You know, (laughs) it's boring that way. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you to our sponsor, Manscaped. And Rob, where can the people find you? You can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM or find me on the Post Geek Singularity YouTube channel or postgeeksingularity.com. Nice. And I am Chris Carr. You can find me at actor Chris Carr on both Twitter and Instagram, or you can check out my voiceover studio, speakfriendstudio.com. I actually just added some, um, the Samwise special where we help share the load and it's a lower price for people who are on a tighter budget. So we have a couple of those Shit, if you need I those. It. I see what you did there. Yeah. That was very nice of you. Acting classes should be accessible and affordable for all. No gatekeeping here. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. And until next time, have a good one. <laughs>